Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to class. Uh, it's Friday, I know it's the last day of the week, so we're kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of waiting for the weekend to rest. Okay, but uh, we just pray that God will give us the grace and the strength to go through this day to, you know, open our minds to receive what he has, what he has to teach us, what he has to speak to us, that we would uh, be willing to listen and hear. Okay. Uh, welcome to our online students as well. Welcome to Nina and Arilla and Krisha. Uh, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? You can come up here in front and you can pray so our online students can also see, you know, our uh, in-person students. Anyone wants to come and pray? Come. Come, Charisma. So this is Charisma, and she's going to lead us in prayer. You can stand right in front of the camera, or you can, yeah. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we love you, Lord. Lord, I surrender this class into your hands. We ask, God, that you will speak to us, that you will make it clear to us, God, that we will understand every word that proceeds from your mouth, that you will remove the distractions from our mind and help us to concentrate and focus on what um, Selena Mam is teaching. Lord, we ask for your grace and your mercy, God. Lord, I also pray that you will reveal your purpose, God, as we are going through these lessons into each and every one of our lives. I cover each and every one by your blood. Be with us and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Charisma. Okay. Okay, so... Uh... We were looking at the nine guideposts. What is the first one? Recognize. Sorry? Okay. Uh, recognize the teaching in God's word. Second one. Recognize the seeds, what God has put into your life, uh, the talent, the, uh, the giftings. Okay, what else? Uh, recognize the stirring within. God stirs us up, uh, leads us to do some things, uh, compels us to do some things. Okay, yes. I think Krisha has also said stirring. Okay, thank you, Krisha. Okay, what is the next? Recognize the grace of God that is on your life. Okay, what did we understand by the grace of God? Divine favor, divine empowerment, and grace is also the character of God. Okay, this, so the three contexts that we see in the uh, New Testament. Okay, and what did we learn about grace? <laughs> what did we understand about grace, calling, your gifts? What did we understand about that? Okay, God's power works in and through us. When does God's power work in and through us? When there's greater responsibility, there's greater empowerment. Okay, uh, so but what did we learn? Grace is given to? Different measures to everyone, but grace is given to everyone. Very good. Okay. Grace is given to everyone. Okay. And then grace is given for what? Okay. It is given to fulfill your function, to accomplish God's plan and purpose for your life. Very good. Thank you. And what else? When you have the grace of God to fulfill a specific function and you are fulfilling that uh, specific function that God has given you, you're positioning yourself right, what do you experience? Yes, you experience the power of God. Thank you, Karen. You experience the power of God and that's how you know that you are in the right place fulfilling uh, the right um, function that God has given you. Okay? And also grace means what? When you have grace, you just can't sit back and 
relax. You know, you have to work hard. You have to labor hard. Okay. Okay. Then what is the next one? Recognize the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Holy Spirit leads and guides us, teaches us, reveals the mind of God to us, reveals the plans and the purposes um, of God to us. Because we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no has entered into the heart of man, okay, what God has prepared for those who love him. But who has revealed it to us? It's the Holy Spirit who reveals it to us. Okay, what's the next principle? Kaipos. Recognize the circumstances. Okay, God puts us in different circumstances. We need to recognize that he works uh, according to that. Then what else? Recognize godly counsel and wisdom. That is where we stopped. Okay, so we said that godly counsel is not a command. It is some instruction. It is sharing of knowledge that is given to us. Okay, I hope you are open the PDF in front of you so you can just follow. Um, so we need to, um, you know, um, we also receive uh, or we know God's plan and purpose for our life through godly counsel. Okay, through people uh, who have, uh, through the wisdom and the counsel of people who have been experienced in that. Feel. And I gave you examples of how uh, not to ask counsel from your own peers. Sometimes, yes, peers can help us in certain aspects of our life. But when you're making strategic, important decisions, you know, uh, it's important not to ask our peers because, you know, they are not people who have gone through those experiences. It's better to ask somebody who is uh, older. Okay. And I gave you an example of King Rehoboam. Remember what happened? He asked his peers, he asked also counsel from, uh, you know, wise men who were in his father's time, okay? And they gave him the counsel, uh, you know, and he followed the counsel of his peers. And what happened? The whole kingdom of Israel got divided. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, and then we stopped there. Um, we looked at um, Paul um, in uh, what he writes in First Corinthians chapter 7. And then we moved on to, and I gave you some verses to read from Proverbs. I hope you read those verses from Proverbs. They're simple, just one-liners. And then we stopped at the example of um, uh, Moses and Jethro in Exodus chapter 18. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 18, we see that Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law, comes to visit Moses, and he sees Moses from sunrise to sundown. What is he doing? What is he doing? Yes, he's judging people, sitting and judging, you know, uh, one person comes and says, you know, this man... Um, you know, he's building his wall on my property. Another one comes and says, husband and wife, they are fighting. They're not able to get along with each other. Neighbors are fighting. So whole day, you know, Moses is judging the people. And then when Jethro sees this, he realizes that it's, this is going to drain Moses. Okay, it's totally going to drain Moses. So he tells Moses, uh, can I give you an advice? Okay, uh, and he, what's the advice he gives him? Anyone knows? Okay, to set up people uh, in groups so that, you know, people can come to them for judging. And what does he tell Moses? You are supposed to be hearing from God. Okay, so important things about the community or the people of Israel, uh, important decisions th that these elders cannot judge, they can bring it to you. And you are supposed to be in a place where you are just hearing from God. Just let the other leaders, you know, train them and uh, give them the job and let them execute the job of uh, judging. And this, uh, what does Jethro say? Okay, you're just my father-in-law. You have no business in my uh, business. Mind your own business, did he say that? No, he listens, he takes advice and counsel because he knows that his father-in-law is much older. He's giving a, um, you know, a counsel or wisdom to him and um, he takes it and then he implements it and it just benefits him. So here we see that, you know, um, we need to be humble enough to receive counsel. Okay, we need to be humble enough to receive counsel from those who God has placed over our 
lives. Okay, sometimes we don't want to listen to counsel of people and what they're telling us because we think, you know, we know better, right? But we need to acknowledge this fact that when God has placed somebody over us, whoever they might be, okay, um, you know, we need to respect that we need to listen to their counsel, we need to humble ourselves and listen to them because that honors God. And here we see that Moses was raised up like a leader. He could have told his father-in-law, you don't know about leadership. You know, you've not, you've just led sheep, you've not led people, you know. Uh, I know better, I know what I'm doing. If God has to tell me what to do, then he would have told me, okay, Moses, you don't be judging everybody, you do this. But we see Moses' humility in listening to his father-in-law. Okay, So it requires humility for us, and that is what God is more interested in. That when somebody who God has placed over our lives, who is in charge over us, we need to humble ourselves and we need to listen to them. Okay, uh, And um, uh, receive counsel uh, and what they are telling us to do. So there are three kinds of counsel. Okay, the first one is counsel based on person's own knowledge and experience. So, you know, people give us counsel based on their own knowledge and experience. Um, okay, I also said that don't go to people who, you know, will say yes to your yes. Yeah, okay, don't go to people who say yes to your yes. That means, you know, when you think this is what should be done and you know somebody your own age somebody your own uh, peer group you know feels the same thing then it's not going to help or benefit you go to somebody who's you know uh, who is um, older than you who has much better experience who will be able to help you to see the other side of um, things okay um, you know go to people who are willing to look at you in your face and say this is not right this is wrong. This is what you should be doing. This is how you should be behaving. This is what God, what honors God. Okay. And that's why sometimes we don't go to our parents. Okay. Because they look us in the face and they will tell us what is wrong. But we go to our peers because they look us in the face and they'll feel sad for us and they say, Yeah, I mean, I'm going through this. You know, this is, you know, what you're saying is right. What you're doing is right okay um and psalm chapter one verse one says blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly okay or stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the uh, seat of the scor uh, scoffers or scornful which means that you know we don't take advice from the ungodly of course the ungodly people can also give us wisdom in certain areas of our life but when it comes to spiritual things when it comes to god's plans and purposes for our lives it's good to uh, uh, get advice from those who are you know godly who are mature who have better experience okay the second one is counsel based on god's written word we've already looked at it you know god's word gives us the counsel it guides us it teaches us it um, rebukes us it trains us in righteousness and holiness the third one is counsel based on prophetic inspiration okay so sometimes uh, through prophetic words we can receive counsel which will direct us in the uh, in the in the season that we are in it will direct us in the next season that we are going into or entering into but we need to um, uh, the important thing here is the first one the counsel uh, that we receive from people the third one the uh, prophetic inspiration the counsel we receive from uh, prophetic inspiration has to be tested has to be verified, has to be, uh, you know, uh, 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 verified, has to be tested. And how do we test it? By God's word. Okay, We go back to uh, God's word and we test it uh, from God's word, okay, to see if this is what God wants us to do, uh, if this is what God is telling us. Because not every prophet releases a prophetic word. Let me give you an example. Okay, sometimes we just take, you know, people's prophetic words, uh, uh, you know, uh, as like, you know, the written word of God. Okay, but we need to test that. And, you know, sometimes um, uh, even prophets, you know, can make an error. Okay, uh, for example, First Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 to 5, uh, we read there that, you know, um, David had a desire to build God's house, right? 
And so when Prophet Nathan comes, he tells him, you know, uh, I dwell, he tells him that, you know, I'm dwelling in this big house of cedar, a big palace, but the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is just in tents, okay, in a tent, okay? And so Nathan um, uh, tells David, do all that is in your heart because God is with you. And now David is very excited because he receives this word from, um, sorry, David is very excited, yes, because he receives this word from Prophet Nathan. Okay, so he thinks this must be even God's plan for his life. And so, you know, he, you know, Nathan goes back and at night, you know, the word of the Lord comes to Nathan saying in verse uh, 4 of chapter 17, go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. Okay, so what does Prophet Nathan say first? Yes, don't go ahead, do whatever else God has put in your heart. But then God tells Nathan, no, this is not my plan. So it's important that we test counsel, uh, what we receive from people and from uh, prophets. Okay, and how do we test these counsels? How do we test if it is, uh, you know, what God is telling us in this season, in this point of our life? Of course, it is, has to go according to the written word of God. But also we read in Romans chapter 14, uh, verse 7, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. So if the counsel, somebody is giving you a counsel, whether it's a man, woman, godly man, woman, or it's a prophetic word, then, you know, it should produce righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay, when it produces righteousness, peace, and joy, it's from the kingdom. If it's not, it's not of the kingdom. So this is one way you can uh, test a uh, counsel that you receive. That is for the first and the third one. Those two things, you know, word of God, you can just, um, uh, you know, receive it and you can believe because it's the written word of God. Okay, so that is um, recognizing, um, you know, godly counsel, wisdom and uh, counsel from godly men and women. The next principle is recognizing the times and seasons. Now, if you want to discover God's plan and purpose for your life, it's important to recognize the times and seasons that you are in because God works according to his time, okay? And he works according to, uh, he does things according to his time. God has a time when he does things in in history and even in our lives, okay? Uh, God has a timetable, okay, which he has already planned before. And even before the foundations of the world, God has a timetable, so to say. How do we know that? If you read uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says there that I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, who is God talking about here? I will put enmity between you and the woman. I put enmity between you and the woman. So who's a you here? Satan, Satan and woman. Between your seed and her seed. So who's the two seeds here? If you look at the seed there in that verse, if you look into Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you know, I want all of you to see it. Um, the small seed and a capital seed, okay, a, a small s for seed and then followed by a capital S for a, the other seed, okay. So the small s is talking about whom? The seed of the woman, okay. So whenever we see spirit, which is written in small s, it's talking about human spirit, but wherever it's talking, if it has a capital S, it's referring to the Holy Spirit, okay. So the same way with God and God, okay? Capital G is talking about the true and living God. Small g is talking about idols, okay? So here seed is talking about the seed of the woman and the capital seed is talking about Jesus Christ, okay? Who will come in the, who is the seed of the woman? But it's talking about Jesus Christ. And it says here, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So again, capital H, which is referring to Jesus Christ. Christ. So Jesus will bruise the, uh, the Satan will bruise the heel of Jesus, but you know, Jesus will, uh, you know, you know, strike uh, Satan. So here we see that, you know, um, uh, God has this plan to bring about this in history, but how long does it take? 
before the seed comes. Almost 4,000 years. Okay? Before 4,000 years, God has already planned that the seed of the woman, that is Jesus Christ, will uh, bruise the head of the serpent. Okay? Uh, will crush, sorry, will crush the head of the serpent. Okay? Yes. Yes. But, so uh, God is saying, I will put enmity between uh, the woman and serpent, and between your seed and her seed is between your seed is, you know, uh, with, uh, with man, and also her seed, which is referring to Jesus Christ. Because uh, Satan you know, uh, uh, tempted Jesus. We just read one temptation that's given in Matthew, but we there were there would have been numerous temptations where Jesus um, was tempted, and also we see that you know um, uh, Satan would uh, you know bruise the head of uh, Jesus, but Jesus will crush the head of the serpent. Okay, will crush Satan on the. So it's basically talking here about the seed, the capital S, so referring to Jesus Christ who will come, you know, and would on the cross would uh, defeat Satan and, um, you know, uh, disarm him and, uh, you know, uh, remove all the powers that he has. Okay. Yeah, enmity is, I'll put enmity between your seed. That means enmity, we'll have enmity between Satan and us and also enmity between Jesus and uh, Satan. Okay, uh, Satan is an enemy of Jesus, and he's also our enemy, right? Okay, so it took four thousand years, even though it was in God's timetable, it took four thousand years for God to uh, fulfill it. Why did it take four thousand years? They look at Galatians chapter four, verse four. What does it say? When the fullness of time had come. Okay, so. God had this in his timetable even before the foundations of the world. But why did it take 4,000 years? Because the fullness of time, the right time. Okay, uh, you need to remember that in God's timetable, there are two things for time. One that there is chronos time, chronological time, which he does chronologically. Chronologically means, you know, um, the things that he's unfolding. Okay, and there is a kairos time. What is a kairos time? It's the fullness of time. It's a God's appointed time, the right time when God will bring about things in your life. Okay, so you go through chronos time where you're a child, you're a baby, you're an infant, you know, you grow up and, you know, God does everything for you in um, uh, according to the chronos time. Okay, what you need as a baby, as an inf in infant, a baby, a child, uh, a, a, a grown-up, a teenager, a youth, an adult. Okay, he does everything. But there is a kairos time when God in his kairos time will fulfill his plan and purpose in your life. And that is God's appointed time. Okay, so God has appointed times and seasons when he does things. He does not do things randomly. We already learned that, right? He does... He's God of design, perfection. He doesn't do things randomly. Okay. Uh, we see that, you know, even before the Israelites were in Egypt, how many years were there in Egypt? The Israelites as slaves, 400 years. Even before that, did God say that they're going to be in uh, slavery for 400 years? Who did he say it to? Yeah, he said that to Abraham. Thank you, Nina. He said that to Abraham. So he said that 400 years, your descendants will be, in an, um, in an unknown place, there will be a slaves, but I will deliver them, okay? So we see that um, God delivered them, you know, even though it was in his timetable, but at the right moment, you know, God delivered them after 400 years, actually after 430 years. Why 430 years? Because Moses, you know, he did things in his own flesh and it delayed things. Uh, some more. So we need to remember this, that, you know, God has kairos moments for us, the right time when he's going to fulfill things in our life. But if we don't walk according to God's plan and purpose, if we don't position ourselves right, if we do things, we make uh, judgments and decisions and choices according to our flesh, it delays 
God's uh, kairos moments. That means what he wants to do in our life, what he wants to fulfill in our lives. Okay, another example is when um, the Israelites, you know, they were taken into Babylonian captivity. What did God say? How many years he, they will be in Babylonian captivity? 70 years. After 70 years, what did God do? In the fullness of time, he raised up King Cyrus, and King Cyrus allowed them to go back from Babylon to Israel to build uh, the walls and to uh, relocate and to live back in Israel. So God has a timetable for, your, for you as well. Okay, uh, Psalm 31 verse 15 says, the psalmist says, My times are in your hands. Okay, tell your neighbor, God, your time is in God's hand. Okay, your time is in God's hand. Okay, your when, your when, your how, your why are all in God's hands. Okay, the calendar of your life is not hanging on, in your bedroom or in your hall or, uh, you know, in your house. The calendar of your life is actually in the hands of God. Can we say an amen to that? Amen. Yes, amen. Okay, so the calendar of your life is in God's hands. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, For everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. For everything there is a season, okay? There might be things in your heart that you want to do, that you want to uh, fulfill. But we must understand that everything that is in your heart, there is a time, there is a pointed time, there is a pointed season. Okay, uh, for it to unfold here on earth. Okay, and we also know this uh, verse, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Okay, when does he make all things beautiful? In his time. Yes, when does he make all things beautiful? In his time. Not in our time, not in what we want to choose, not uh, when we want, but it's in his time. A time he makes all things beautiful. In, in his time, he will bring about perfection, he will bring about fullness, he will bring to maturity everything that is required of us in his appointed time. And God is never late, he's always on time. Okay, tell your neighbor, God is never late, he's always on time. You know, sometimes we think, God, why are you delaying these things in my life? But God is always on. Um, time okay so we need to learn to view our life in seasons very important okay um uh, do you view your life in seasons yes no yes only one person two people three okay how do you view your life in seasons Okay, a season when you are happy, season when you're sad. What are the seasons in your life? Yes, as a student, a time when you start working, time when you are, uh, you know, going through marriage, a time of parenting, you know, before that what? You just arrived at that point as a student? No, you were an infant, you went to childhood, you went to, you know, young age and you were teenage, young adults, and now you're, uh, you know, young adults, some of you, some of you are adults as well, okay? And then you will, you know, transition to different seasons in um, life. So we need to view our life in uh, seasons. Now, we need to view where you are today particularly. In what season of life you are in now is very, very important, okay? You're not going to remain in this season for the rest of your life, okay? There will be a new season that will come, but you need to recognize what season you are in presently, okay? The same way, even as we go through different seasons in life, even in our walk with God, okay, we go through seasons in our journey with god we go through different seasons we go through a new season as well so in every season god has a plan and a purpose that he wants us to fulfill so if you understand which season of life you are in you will understand what you're supposed to do and what you are not supposed to do okay so now you're in a season where um, you are a student okay as a student you're not thinking about uh, 
motherhood or you're not thinking about being a parent, right? What are you thinking? You're thinking of just to study, to equip yourself in the word of God in ministry so that you can launch out into ministry. Okay, so what is your next season of life? Your next season of life could be where you are launching out into ministry. Or for some of you, your next season of life could also be that you are launching out into ministry and also you're thinking of about settling down in life, marriage. Okay, so we need to understand the season that we are in so that we can understand what God's plan and purpose for our life is in this season and for the next season. If you look at First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says... Okay, I want some one of you to read that. Thank you. So here we see that the sons of Issachar, you know, had understanding of the times. Okay, had understanding of the times and it's important for us to have an understanding of the times and the season that we are in so if you don't have an understanding what do you do okay if you don't have an understanding what do you do you recognize the season you can't recognize the purpose god has for you okay if you want to uh, recognize the purpose God has for you in the season, you want to understand, what do you do? Yeah, simple. Just ask God. Thank you. <laughs> as simple as that. You just ask God. Say, God, give me an understanding of the season that I am in. What is the plan? What is the purpose? What do you want me to do? What you don't want me to do? Give me the understanding of the time and season that I am in presently in. And when you ask God, will God reveal? Yes, and that will determine and help you to uh, know what to do in this season, what course of action to take, okay, um, uh, what to pursue, what plans to pursue, what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to carry out, everything God would reveal to you. So understanding the times will teach you what you are supposed to do in a specific season. So ask God, okay, God, what season of life I am in, okay? Um, uh, and then say, God, reveal it to me, show me, uh, help me, and guide me, and lead me. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 5 and 6 says, A wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Okay, so whose heart discerns time and judgment? A wise man. Wisdom comes from God. Doesn't come from just reading textbooks, from worldly knowledge. That is knowledge. Wisdom comes from? God. So you can say, God, give me the wisdom to understand the times and seasons, to so judge what I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do. And it says in verse 6, because every matter there is a time and judgment. For every matter in life, there is a right time and the right thing that we are supposed to do. Okay, And only a wise man or a wise woman will be able to understand what action to take okay all of us are not wise in ourselves but we get wisdom from god so we must ask god god give me the wisdom to understand what time and season i am in what action i must take and live life season by season okay and if you do then you will be able to realize you know uh, what god is doing in the season and he what he wants to do in the next season of your life okay now there are different seasons that we go through there is a foundation season okay the foundation season does not necessarily be when you are uh, children okay when you are studying in grade one to grade ten but it can even be now now is your foundation uh, you know a uh, period of foundation or laying season where you are basically uh, building yourself up to be ministers of god or to be in full-time ministry Okay, now is foundation season um, a very beautiful season? When you're build, when you uh, you know when the, a building is being built, is the foundation season very beautiful? No, it's very messy. It's very dirty. There's mud all over. Everything is dug. You know, and there's a you know uh, uh, you know how big the building is, 
that big, deep, the, 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 the earth. And you don't go and look and say, wow, what a beautiful, awesome pit this is, okay? You just look at it and say, oh, I mean, how much of mud, how deep they have, you know, uh, have dug into the earth. Okay, so foundation uh, time is not easy, it's very messy, it's very dirty, it's not beautiful, it's not glamorous, uh, nobody claps for us. Uh, it also involves a lot of hard work, digging and digging and digging, you know, um, so that the foundations is strong uh, and there is no building coming up you know when a building comes up everyone say wow what a beautiful uh, uh, you know house you know what uh, look at that color look at these grills you know what uh, beautiful architecture or you know, look at a building you know uh, uh, you you just you know stand in awe of it but then you know when uh, when the foundation period is a, is a time when it's hard work you know it's a messy work it's difficult, it's going to be strenuous, it's going to be painful, uh, it's not glamorous, and it's also hard work. You have to really work hard. No one is going to applaud you. People are just going to look at you and say, you're not supposed to be doing this, you're not supposed to be doing this, this is how you have to be, this is how you have to learn, this is... So, you know, as students now, all of you are in a foundation period and it's not going to be easy when i was in bible college when i was in the foundation period it was not at all easy for me okay first time going out of home and you know um, staying in a hostel with people from different cultures you're put with uh, people from different uh, cultures different mindsets different attitudes you know you had to adjust you know, to a roommate, to when you want to sleep is playing the music, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when when uh, you want to study, um, you know, she is trying to clean the room or, uh, you know, we have different people with different temperaments, different mindsets. And you're wondering, God, did I come to Bible college uh, with these kind of people? I mean, God is really teaching us that nobody is perfect. So when you're going to go into ministry, you're going to, you're going to minister to imperfect people just like I am imperfect and you know God taught me that very early on in life because now I handle two teams with so many people with different mindsets different attitudes uh, you know and God is uh, giving me the grace to handle them because I know okay if I do this then this is the sun if I do that this is how I need to say this, this so I'm thankful to God that I went through this six years in Bible college you know handling different people from different mindsets from different cultures it just God's given me the understanding, the grace, the maturity, how to handle people. And it's coming to a place of leadership. You don't have this experience. It can throw you out of gear and there can be so much of disunity. You'll be fighting with each other rather than doing God's work. Okay. So it taught me to learn to live in unity with others who are different mindsets. It's basically God teaching me that, you know, uh, unity is more important than what is your legitimate right, what you think is right, what is what you think is wrong. And even in Bible college, when, you know, every day for breakfast, we had chapati with three curries, which they rotated. Every afternoon, we had dal and rice with three vegetables that was rotated. And, you know, every uh, time for dinner, we had I had egg curry because, you know, I don't eat buff beef. It was buffalo's meat. And then I don't eat pork. So every day it was egg curry. So, you know, God is again teaching me that, you know, um, ministry is not a matter of convenience. It's not convenience. Okay, you it's 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 hardships. You need to face all this. And God is not saying, I want you to eat all this so that you can suffer and all. No, you know, He's just training us up to know that, you know, God, I'm willing to give up all of these things, pleasures in life, just to pursue the call. So, you know, I've been here in ministry for 22 years. I would have quit a long time back when I saw attitudes of people, when things got difficult, when um, when people say, No, you have to do this, you have to do it this way. You know, I could have just quit. But all of this training actually helped me to, you know, run my race with perseverance and endurance. Saying all these are, you know, small things. You know, God, God will remove it. What is it I have to do ministry? So if I do have to do ministry, I, you know, I have to deal with all of these things. God will remove it. Give me the grace. But what is more important is to fix my eyes on Jesus. And you see, even, uh, even Paul went through so much of hardships and difficulties in, uh, in life. You know, but you see, even in prison, when he's nearing death, he's writing his letters to 
committee. He's writing his letters to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Philemon. He's writing his letter to um, uh, Titus, and he's encouraging them. Imagine in a position where he's going to face death. You know, my, you know, even be persecuted. You know, he's writing letters of encouragement. Why? Because he's gone through all. You know, if you read for Corinthians, he talks about all the hardships that he's gone through. Right. So all of those is actually. Did God really want to put all of these hardships in, in, in Paul's life? You know, but why? Just to strengthen his faith, just to say that these things doesn't matter. What you need to do is focus your eyes on, on Jesus. You know, when I went to Bible college, I never used to uh, sw uh, sweep and mop and wash the uh, restrooms and toilet and all that. We had to do it. And we had to wash the toilet and bathroom where everybody used to go. You know, all of us were put into, you know, the timetable and we had to clean. It was really difficult. But I thank God because, you know, when we, uh, APC uses, uh, you know, not our own uh, space. We don't have our own buildings. We use other buildings. And, you know, that sometimes when we meet for children's church, the previous day there would have been a party. They would have, it would have been all messed up. And, you know, we can't, when calling the workers, they say, we'll come. They 10, 15 minutes, they don't come. And I don't wait. I just take the broom and sweep it myself or even just wash the toilet. You know, because for me, you know, you're a pastor and you're sweeping. You're a pastor and washing the toilet. For me, it doesn't really matter because I'm so used to doing it in Bible college. So, you know, I just thank God for all the training that he has given uh, to me. And that is, you know, building our character that is giving us perseverance that is giving us endurance to see that all of these things really matter what really matters is to focus on the calling and you know god will give you the grace to do everything so what is the objective of uh, foundation period the foundation period objective is you know to build a strong foundation a deep foundation a foundation that will allow you to expand and i thank god for those six years it was very difficult at one point of time when i came back from holidays you know i had become so quiet my mother said if this is what bible college is doing to you I, i'm not going to send you back no but i went back because i know that is god's call i know he's training me he's you know refining me he's uh, you know renewing my character so that you know i can just uh, do what god has called me to do and god is teaching me that ministry is not a matter of convenience it's a command that's what god has taught me ministry is not a matter of convenience when it's convenient i'll serve god when it's not convenient i'll just walk out i'll do what i want but god is teaching me ministry is a matter of command Okay, to stay focused. And that is why I stayed for 22 years and God will give me the grace to continue on. Okay. So in life, when we go, you know, God takes us to these seasons, there will be difficult seasons, messy seasons, you know, but God wants us to learn so that we can have a strong character, a strong career. And we need to go through all of these things to learn uh, these things. Okay. The next season is the tunnel season or the dark season or the night season. You know, I know you've all gone in train and when you go through tunnels, what do you do? Scream. <laughs> you scream, right? But when you go through a tunnel, there's no way you can go right or left to escape the tunnel. You can't go back, okay? Only thing is you go forward. Why do you go forward? Because you know there is light. The tunnel is going to end. It's not going to be forever and ever and ever. Amen. Okay, you go through, uh, you go to the tunnel of life with the eyes of faith. Okay, that this tunnel will end. So one thing you know that there is an end to this tunnel, that you're going through the season. The only way out is to go through that tunnel and God would, you know, um, uh, you need to stay faithful. So tell your neighbor, wake him up, sleep, somebody's sleeping, wake them up and say, stay faithful with the tunnel season. Okay, then there's just uh, uh, another season is just enough season versus abundance and harvest. You know, um, you know, there's a season where there is abundance. You know, when you stay with your family, with your parents, there's abundance. Anytime you want anything, you ask them, they'll buy you. You want to eat anything, you want to go anywhere, they'll do it for you. Okay, there is the abundant season. Okay, your parents take care of you. You don't have to cook. They'll just, uh, you know, cook. They'll feed you. They will get everything that is uh, needed for you. Then there will be a season where, you know, um, 
you get married okay then you move out of your parents house maybe you move to a smaller accommodation uh, you have to learn to cook yourself you have to learn to adjust with your husband with your in-laws you have to clean you have to wash okay so it's it's a season where uh, you know just enough season okay when you were with your parents uh, you know, money was freely available. You can do anything, buy everything. But, you know, when you are married, you know, you have to, you're working, you have to divide your finances. So you do more window shopping than real shopping, right? <laughs> you just go and see, okay, this is nice. I'll buy it sometime in the future. Okay. So, um, so this is window shopping, uh, you know, but then as things, you don't stay in that season for long okay as you progress you earn well you move on you can move on to a bigger house you know then you can buy things whatever you want but it's important in those seasons that you stay faithful okay as you become a parent then your needs become secondary to your children's need because you have to take care of their schooling their uh, you know everything that uh, the child needs and your needs become secondary compared to your children compared to taking care of your in-laws or the needs of your uh, extended family as well so just enough season to us is abundant harvest okay but you know in this season god is teaching you how to learn to manage money your finances learning how to say no to certain things, learn, learning how to, um, uh, you know, give up certain things, uh, learning how to put others first. So God is teaching us everything through this just enough versus abundant uh, season, okay? Luke chapter 16, verses 10 and 11 says, if you are faithful in little things, God will give you much, okay? So in these seasons of life, foundation seasons, you know, just... Uh, you know, um, enough season, you know, it's just, you know, you need to be faithful in the season because when God sees you being faithful, he will give you much. Okay. So if you want to move out of the season of just enough, you know, uh, season uh, to a season of abundance, you need to learn to manage and be faithful with the time, the resources, the money, the people that God has given to you. Okay. You need to be faithful with what God has entrusted to you now so that God can entrust you with greater things, okay? Then there's a season of grief and sorrow. We all know that. We all go through seasons and grief and sorrow. But it's very important that, you know, grief is something that Satan uses very subtly to destroy our lives. So you need to break from that spirit of grief because that spirit of grief can bring in uh, depression uh, can uh, suicidal tendencies can also stop you from furthering god's plan and purpose for your um, life okay and also stops you from trusting god okay it can take you away from god because you're angry with god that he took away your uh, loved one and you don't trust god say god i cannot do with, without this my loved one okay this was my all in all but God is saying, I am your all in all. So we're not learning to trust and depend upon God. Then the seasons of trials and challenges. Okay, we all go to trials and challenges, whether it's our health, whether it is, uh, you know, adjusting to uh, new places, new things, uh, the foundation season, whatever. But, you know, during these seasons, God deals with our character. Okay, when God takes you to trials and challenges, it's not because he hates you. He's not punishing you is because he wants to deal with your character okay when paul is writing to the church at um, uh, you know uh, i don't know i think it is corinth he tells you know give this man up to satan you know this man uh, there's a man who is living an immoral life and he tells um, son of the church give him up to satan now paul is not being rude and saying you know give him up to satan say so that satan can destroy his life what paul is really saying is you know give him up to satan means when he is you know, out of God's protection, when Satan brings in all trials and difficulties, then he will recognize his sin. He will turn to God. He will repent. And then he can come back. Okay. And the same thing Paul is even writing to Timothy. You know, have nothing to do with such a person. It's not that, you know, get rid of that person or, you know, shun him totally. But, you know, just leave him out of um, the fellowship. You have nothing to do with him so that, you know, when God's protection is removed, he can, you know, when he goes through trials and uh, 
uh, situations, you know, when God's protection is not over our life, Satan can easily bring in all of trials and uh, persecutions. And when we go through all that, what happens? You know, the person might recognize their sin. God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Please forgive me. And we'll come back to God. Okay, so that is the attitude of God. Not that he wants to punish us, curse us, you know, but through all of these challenges he's and tough seasons in his life, he's teaching us lessons. You know, when I've, whenever I've gone through tough seasons in life, I've, uh, whether it's with another person, whether it's with an organization or whatever, I've always asked God, God, what is my mistake? Show me what I have done wrong. And because when I have able to see what I have done wrong, it has helped me to change my own character. It helps me. It benefits me um, more than anything else. Okay, oh, our break time now. We'll stop here. Okay, and we'll meet after the break.